Hi guys, it's Ollie from Rad Season. I'm stoked today to be joined by our entrepreneur and CEO, co-founder of Stay22, Andrew Lockhead. Uh, Andrew, thanks for coming on the show, man. Hey man, thanks for hosting me. No worries. Um, so whereabouts are you at the moment, dude? Montreal, Canada. Uh -huh. And what, what's, it, what's it been like over there with, um, yeah, the infamous well, Corona? Them. Um, we kind of like uh, reopened a few things. So now people were able to go back to bar and restaurants and go outside. And now we're just about hitting our second streak. Um, so second wave is about to come up. We see that there's more people getting infected, more case. Hospitals are getting more busy than ever. So we feel like uh, it's just about to go down once more. So they're probably going to restrict people going out, uh, ask us to wear more masks. It's going to be a bigger challenge. Wow. And is that because, do you think, like, because it's getting colder, is that something that's... No clue, right? Oh. People are always like, oh, Montreal is so cold, people must be sticking together or something of the sort. <laughs> uh, but we don't know exactly. We feel like it's just a few places where people decided to step outside of the norm. So, like, not wearing masks, not using distanciation. Yeah. And they just catch it, spread it around, and now we have to close a uh, kind of neighborhood or make sure people are not uh, putting it too much out there. Wow. Okay. And um, yeah, I, like, I guess I'd love to talk about where, like, wh like where you grew up. You're, you're, you're originally from Montreal, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Born and raised in Montreal till I was about seven or seven years old. Okay. Um, nice. And then when did, yeah, wh when did you first get into startups? Like, how, how did that begin? Um, startup wise, with it, right after I finished college, uh, but business, I started to get involved in business around 14 or 15 years old. I was working in a family shop, so nothing okay. technology or savvy, it was just a car shop. And uh, so that's where I got my classes and learned from my dad and his partners about how to do sales and marketing and uh, headhunters and relationship. Mm -hmm. But startup wise, like leading my own company, being my own boss, it was right after university. Okay. Uh, and then what was that? Like, what, what did you go into? Yeah. Um, so my first company was a ticketing platform. So okay. uh, back in 2016, I believe, um, I was president of my student union. I was the one hosting all of those college party and frosh and like all of those balls. Mm -hmm. And usually people were only paying in cash. So during the evening, I was kind of going on the dance floor with $10,000 in my pocket, not feeling <laughs> safe at all. Like I was going to get around or something. And I was like, right before even Bright came in, I'm like, there must be a better way. And that's mm -hmm. how we found a way to create a student sphere. So just a platform where people can actually promote, shoulder events, sell tickets online, which was the perfect way for me to just be at college while earning money from people going attending my event. It was a perfect fit. That's cool. And were you doing that like, like just in your college or did you then sort of think, okay, like we can do it and, and spread it out to other colleges? and? Exactly. So one college after each other, similar to what Facebook did. So after you got a great full old, you just expand and expand and expand. Uh, at one point, we were the biggest one in Canada, which is not the case anymore. But we're still the we're there is still the biggest ticketing platform in Quebec for students. Okay. Cool. And d did you like did you partner with anyone to do that, or was that something that you set up on your own, or? No, I'm not a kind of solo guy. I love like having someone that can go on me because usually I'm a super emotional person. So I go through the roller coaster all the time. Like either I'm going to amp up and like I'm going to own the world. And the other half of the time I'm like, it's not working. I want to get out. I'm going to kill myself. It's not going to, as I wanted. So I need someone that's stable with me to make sure it's not happening. And then and then bouncing ideas back and forth as well. And Exactly. So I'm more of into the... Um, a uh, business guy, so like taking care of sales and contract and management. And usually mm -hmm. I find a uh, partner that's going to be more in the tech side. So someone okay. that can code, that can lead a tech team because I'm definitely clueless about this part of the business. Uh -huh. So w was, there, was there two of you who, who, who did that company then, like when you set that up? or? Uh, yeah, it was a different one. So my other partners were a bit more business side. So this was my first mistake as an entrepreneur. We both were business people. So we had to okay. find a partners that actually was on the tech side and that yeah. took me about two years to get through. So a lot of mistake in between. I lost about forty thousand dollars during the first year because of that. And because of that hard mistake, now after this I'm always like, no fucking way. Now it's only going to be about co-founder with tech skill. That's what I need to get things going. Yeah.
Interesting. And then, like, so what happens? Like, like we'll get to st- um, we get to stay twenty two, and then after that, so w- w- what was the journey? What do you do? So five years in, uh, we grew up to about eight employees. Um, but doing the business for five years kind of feel like you've been through everything. We were not scaling mm-hmm. as fast as expected, and I was not able to raise money either. So it was a regular bootstrap company that was just growing slowly but surely. After okay. five years, I tried to do something else where I was uh, getting into the subscription monthly box and I was sending preservative uh, through a box to the parents of kids. So condom. And I was just sending them package uh, every month to their daughter and their uh, children so they yeah. don't get AIDS or SID or, AD or anything else. Did you say that? And I, uh, what, like, what was the switch? What, why did you think? Did you just want to do something like... I wanted different, to go to the B2C side. I was super good at B2B, like doing sales. I was smart on that side. And I was missing the B2C aspect of marketing. I wanted to see if I can scale a company uh, doing retails, actually shipping real product to those people. And yeah. this one has been a total failure. So nine months in, I had to kill a project and jump to the next one. Okay. That's cool. And then, I mean, I, I guess along the way, you know, there, there's, there was quite a lot of learnings and um, the first one, learning out of this one that came out is because I, obviously I was from Montreal. I didn't do a proper business plan with all of the factors and the risk, right? And uh, as we were going to winter, so I think we opened up shop in August or so. And I was, was clearly, uh, coming to Christmas time or so. I didn't thought about the fact that we need to send those preservative in a heated box or find a way to deliver them to the people while they can stay above the uh, frozen temperature. So at one point we're just like, it's not sustainable. I cannot just shut down a company for four months and reopen. Uh, we just decided to let it go. Okay. And 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 then what happened? What, like, what was the next move? Or like, did, did you then look at doing another company mm-hmm. or? Exactly. So next move uh, for me is when I met my other co-founder, Hamed. Mm-hmm. So he was actually the one that raised money for a previous startup. He was in travel. He told me about this problem. I'm like, I understand what's happening. His company was shutting down. I'm like, okay. Let's find something where we can work together on that. I know how to get user for almost free. And I know how I can get those people to sell them product, like hotels, Airbnb, restaurants, parking, and so on. And that's mm-hmm. when we decided to jump ship together and create State 22. Cool. And yeah, so I, I first met, I think, um, you guys back in 2016. Yeah. So when I, when I was starting off Rad Season, I think that was when, like, that was, was that the first year for, for you guys? So you, you were yeah, starting? Yeah, you were uh, one of our first right. customers. I think one of the five customers that trusted us. So thanks for them. No worries, man. So I saw, yeah, I saw what you guys were doing. And what I was trying to build with Rad was to sort of put all these epic events and festivals together. But then the issue was that, you know, when you find out about an event, like where do you stay right so there's all these like different options and hotels and airbnbs and then i saw what you guys were doing the map um which basically has all of them where the venue is um the the event the or festival that you're going to go to and i thought you know this is this is pretty epic and like there's something that i think for and still you know to this day adds to like loads of value for our customers um so how was that first yeah how did you guys go about building that and um, yeah, w- w- where did that start? Yeah, we follow actually the real, uh, well, not the real, but the regular, let's say, startup journey. Uh, we started off, so after Berlin, we knew each other for about four weeks. Uh, we got accepted in an incubator in Denver, Colorado. So okay. both me and the man being from Montreal, working from like a, a small coffee shop. It's like, okay, come over here. We'll pay you like $35,000 so you can spend four months with us. So. He left his family behind. I left my girlfriend. We decided to jump ship, go rent an Airbnb in Denver, and attend a four months program for an incubator over there. And it was just amazing. I was knowing nothing at all about travel. And those guys give me my one on one class like, what is an online travel agency? What are the global distribution systems? What's the difference between room blocks and so on? So I was kind of learning it the hard way. Mm-hmm. And that's where we decided to work with events and work out with ticketing platform. After we came back from Denver, we had an MVP in place that was working pretty well, but not scalable then. And we got accepted into Montreal, uh, biggest accelerator called Founder Fuel. So now it was $100,000, 12 weeks program, and we need to scale that company. So we moved from a team of two to eight within like a 12 week span. And that's where kind of the business really launched. Getting more okay. events, getting more partners, 
And that's how State 22 uh, became what it is today. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And so Hamid, like, like, like he already had the bet, so he was coming from, from the tech side. Um, yeah. And then he, he like, didn't he have something? So he, he, he was running a company before that. Um, was that in the same industry? Was that in events or within travel? Or? Only travel. So uh, his biggest mistakes with time is he was trying to fight against Expedia and Booking.com under the same turf. Like on SEO, SCM, which is yeah, almost yeah, yeah. impossible, right? You don't have that marketing budget to uh, to own them. And when I came abroad, I'm like, stop going head to head against them and trying to find a way where we can just be lazy and reach those user, high intent user during the transaction process. We know for a fact that they're looking to travel. And for mm -hmm. me, which is easy, I'm coming from the event industry. I've been owning companies in the past in the event. I've been owning a ticketing platform. I'm like. How know how to reach hundreds of millions of users that are looking to, for a place to go sleep, to go to restaurants, to find a parking nearby. Let's get yeah. those people right at a perfect timing. And this is why State 22 is doing so well, uh, is because we know when the user to reach him out. Cool, man. Um, and what would you say, like, the biggest difficulties during, like, or, or the biggest barriers during that initial time of building it? Getting the first customer. Like, okay. It's getting so hard when you're reaching out to the even bright of this world or asking, who the fuck are you? <laughs> you're like, oh, we're a small team of two people building something great. Like, believe us, we need to work out fine. It's never working. So you need to get uh, things in the right order. So we first started off with smaller events, small aggregators mm -hmm. um, that trusted us, like yourself, that decided to do a leap of faith and say, you know what? Let's give you a shot and like, we'll see what happened. Yeah. I remember one of our first customers asked us for a letter of our investor telling that we were a safe company, that we were not going oh, to really? save money, like we were going to have enough runway. So uh, it was one great way to just get those things. And as we were getting bigger partners, we were able to leverage that to onboard more partners as well. And that's mm -hmm. how we ended up last year with CES, uh, South by Southwest, and working with bigger companies with time. Cool. And was there, um, I mean, were you trying to focus on, I guess, individual events as well as different platforms as well or like actually um i always wanted to go for volume right because overall we're not making that much money per booking so we need mm -hmm. to get a ton of them to be sustainable so i always wanted to work with ticketing platform i was yep. owning them in the past i knew my competitors i knew what they were looking for the sales pitch was easy for me but when it came up at the F travel port i was reaching out to them and they didn't give a shit like they're not knowing us. We didn't have any brand notoriety. We didn't have business, business case. My deck were awful. Like they had no way to just say, okay, we'll give you a shot and put you on our millions of like landing page. It's not going to happen. Yeah. So this is how we started with the first step. Events. Events is going to take a week and a half of close. So super fast. Mm -hmm. If they're not going to bring money, I know that I can get those people fast. So, and this is how we went up to find the fuel. This is how we raise money. And as soon as the money at the bank, we're like, screw events. We don't want to work with them anymore. Let's go work with the platforms. And this is how we just switch a business to do what we wanted. But at first, okay. nobody trusted us to do it. OK. No, that's really interesting, man. And then I, I guess like, like with you guys over those last couple of years, then so you were just growing, building the team. Um, growing the number of events, obviously the number, number of platforms on board. Um, and then with what happens this year for obviously not just the travel industry, but the events industry, the, the entertainment industry, how did that happen? I mean, did everything just stop or like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just like we had a wall, man. We were yeah. doing Forex year over year. Like since we launched a company, we were doing $25 million of business last year. We were supposed to do about $100 million of, uh, of growth sell in 2020. So things were doing amazing. Team of 25, mm. we're hitting our numbers. Like we were on fucking fire. I'm not joking. Like I was so happy to be leading that team. Those people were super resourceful. I was feeling like invincible. Then we heard about COVID in Asia. We're like, yeah, but it's too far away. It's not going to happen. Yeah. One of our advisors told us, by the way, guys, if you manage to get the same number as last year, you'll be doing great. I'm like, screw that. We have bigger project than this. It's going to be great. Don't worry about it. And around the 15th of March, we heard the news. States were closing the border with Europe. We felt, okay, this is bigger than expected. 
what's happening now. And within a week span, we lost about 95% of our revenues. So moving wow. from about $200,000 of sales per month to roughly 50. Wow. Yeah, because I remember, I don't know, I was in Cologne. I was at a, a carnival, um, like Cologne Carnival, one of the biggest carnivals in Europe in February, end of February. And like traffic was great. We were getting like, you know, we were getting a couple of bookings or like um, people booking accommodation every day. And, you know, like, like things were good. And then um, two people, I like, just heard that there's, yeah, there's two people in the carnival that have been, that have got this coronavirus, you know, been infected and didn't really think much of it. You know, it won't last very long. And then come middle of, I think it was like 15th of March when they announced the borders were closing. The traffic just it just tanks like overnight, like eighty percent. I was like, what? What has just happened? Um, yeah, and I think every single person, you know, I mean, like we're, we're lucky that we're not in the situation where actually running running the events. Um, yeah. So you know, there was a bit of pivoting um, going on, but yeah, it's interesting. I mean, what what are you what are you sort of seeing now? I mean, have you guys sort of been looking and like looking at the like forecasting and looking at your data? I mean, that you pretty much what we do every week, if it's not every day at this point. We're yeah. just trying to see when the second trend is going to go up. Um, there's a few things that are changing around right now. So uh, one of them is that uh, things that we're tracking is like, what's the difference between Airbnb, so short-term rentals versus hotels? Yeah. And like, there's a big challenge. What does the booking window look like? So people are booking more in advance, or are they going to book uh, more closer to the date so they can cancel as well? And what's the difference between, let's say, Europe and United States or North America? So we're kind of tracking what's happening all around the world to know when is going to be the boom. Because believe me, it's a question of time before things go back to not only normal, but are going to go even bigger. People yeah. have been inside for months now. They just want to go and attend some events. I think so. And, and what, are you, what are you seeing, say, with the first one with Airbnb and with hotels? Is there a trend yeah. of people... Are people trusting Airbnb or are they going to go, okay, I'm going to stay in a hotel? Actually, at first, what we saw during the first week, uh, first month of March is people were booking more hotel. So all of a sudden, hotels were up. And after running some customer survey, we find out that the reason why is because hotels felt more safe, like yeah. more professional. People have cleaning team in there uh, to make sure that the sheets are going to be pretty. Everything is going to get clean and sanitized compared to Airbnb. Yeah. And then a couple of months ago, we saw the exact opposite going around. So Airbnb was boosting back up. And we saw that the hotels were going just only for 40% to 27%. So people wanted to go for longer stay. Obviously, mm -hmm. you like to have a kitchen if you're going to stay for a week instead of a few days. And yep. Airbnb made much more sense for those people. Yeah. And then I, I guess you feel that you don't have to go out as much whereas if you're in a hotel room you know you're going to be going out lunch and dinner exactly. and, and you're just yeah. still crazy in your small room as you can have a terrace on the airbnb you can go a bit yeah. out. and one thing that we saw as well was the trend regarding booking window so at first we saw that people were booking much closer to the event because they can feel like they can close or cancel if it's not going to happen or at least they have a better understanding mm -hmm. but now we saw that the booking windows moved from 41 days to 82 days so they exactly doubled and people are obviously taking those choice of uh, free cancellation. They're taking yeah. advantage of all the program that they have in place as of now. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's what we're seeing almost from this month. So that people are yeah. looking at, you know, booking out for, for next year. So taking, taking a punt and thinking, okay, like, hopefully, you know, if the vaccine comes in and, and the events and the, and the big carnivals and, and festivals can happen again in June, yeah. July, whenever it may be, then book now. And then if there's a cancellation, if there's a free cancellation policy, then it's worth it. And um, taking advantage of it. It just makes much more sense for them. Like, who would like to reserve in advance? And there's absolutely no problem with this. So that trend yeah. is only going to keep going up, I believe. Okay. And then what about, um, uh, like, domestic and international? Are you seeing anything, you know, there's obviously talk of, like, okay, people are just going to go and explore their own neighborhoods or their backyard, you know, or, the, or their own state. Is that something yeah. you're seeing or...? Yeah, actually it is. Uh, so there's a bit amount of difference. And Europe is so strange because all of those countries are having their own behavior. So something that we're going to see in UK will probably not be represented at all in France or we might as well get in Barcelona or Spain. So we need to track all of them differently to know exactly what's happening and how does the country react. So sometimes it may be about local regulation. 
local yeah. policy can be about the way communication has been done uh, through the medias and channel. So we're kind of tracking all of those country um, side by side and feeling it. But uh, from the survey we're reading, like the one from Ticketmaster, where about 5,000 people have replied, like people don't want to go back to event. They want to go back twice as much now than it was two months ago. So as okay. we're getting more safe and like inside our own small place, people just want to explore, just want to go out. But you're 100% right. It's much more about local travel. People yeah. want to take as a plane, they didn't want to take uh, their car. So if you look at this um, this way, much more uh, people are already moved to move that thing, but they're also more concerned. So you can see that they jump by about 31 to 40 percent. People are getting extremely concerned about the, the the coronavirus, especially in the states. So is yeah. it because of Trump? Is it because of what's happening around? I don't know. I just can tell you that it's going up. Okay. And what um, what about in Canada? How's the feeling yeah. there? Yeah, actually, Canada is doing better. So Canada, in that sense, they're feeling a bit more safer. So I don't know exactly why, but they yeah. do uh, have more bookings. They're getting less concern and less fear about uh, this whole coronavirus. So they're doing more bookings. Okay, interesting, man. And with with the events industry, I mean, are, uh, are events now? Are you sort of seeing, or is the trend for people to be running smaller events, or are they putting like measures in place, or sort of saying, okay, 2020, we're done. We're going to reschedule for 2021 or 2022. Um, yeah, 2020 is pretty much uh, over. So I've been yeah. talking with a few um, event organizer, ticketing platform, all of those like promoters as well. And even though they're trying to push back the date, they know now it's not going to happen anymore. So everything mm -hmm. has been kind of so or postponed. And the good news about this is people are still ready to attend those events. So um, okay. Ticketing platform that decided to offer uh, money back guarantees are getting a massive bump right now. Two about two out of three fans are ready to purchase those tickets because they know they'll oh, be wow. able to get their cash back. So you can get your cash back on your hotel. You can get your cash back as well on the tickets. The only thing you have need to do is set, uh, set a calendar reminder for the invite. If it's happening, wonderful. If it's not, too bad. You get your money back. Yeah, pretty risky for the uh, for the platform and the okay. organizer. But yeah. It is, but what else can you do? Like people are not going to purchase those tickets otherwise. So oh, yeah. you might exactly. have to hold on the money for that uh, for that time. Yeah. And um, what have you guys? So between sort of March and now, what do you, what did you do? Like w any like in, like was there any sort of additional products or or features or you know like what, what did you do as a company as Stay Twenty Two? Yeah, um, Uncle Leon and we started to cry all together. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Had a beer and you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, man. we've been working so hard for this. You know, <laughs> and we do have an amazing team. So what we decided to do on the first uh, few days after the virus hit is we decided to host a hackathon with all of the teams combined. So okay. uh, for people that are not knowing too much about hackathon is when you decide to work on a specific project. So you mention a problem and people get in smaller team to work on that specific project and they need to present uh, their result at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So. All of our team decided to split into a team of two or three, and they're working on something that they thought could be relevant for the virus. And out of the 12 projects that came out of there, there's actually three of them that we implemented. Okay. So one of them was about, um, the problem was always about coronavirus, it's what's going to yeah. be the solution. And we decided to take three angles. So one of them is, uh, we're going to sell something different. So another product or services to our customer base. Uh -huh. They didn't work as much because our customer base are not having any type of revenue right now. They're not ready to get uh, sell anything, so that kind of died by itself. Yeah. Number two, we decided to uh, take our product and move it into another industry. So if entertainment is going down and travel is not going to bounce back up, who else can be interested about this? Uh -huh. And this is how we launch something in the retail space. So okay, where cool. we can actually sell after someone purchased. Uh, it can be a book, it can be some sheets, it can be a cap, electronics as well. So we move our product into that segment of the industry. And the last one was, our product is shit, it's not going to work out. The industry is over, it's true, what can we do? Well, we still have that amazing team of people that have been working together for years. And those yeah. people are real hustlers and hackers. So how can we make them work on something else that we never did in the past? And we're still working out on a few projects uh, out of that. But 
it's been hard. I'm not lying. We had to let go yeah. amazing people. Uh, we had to make difficult decisions. But in the end, it was for the best of the company. We're looking mm -hmm. for the long term vision. Yeah. And are you guys? Are, are you now then focused on uh, on on looking at 2021 and thinking, okay, like like looking at like almost setting like a vision or another vision or like a roadmap for for, for next year? Yeah, so we're having right now three different case scenarios. So best case scenario for investor, worst case scenario where we have like to become a zombie company and in between. And okay. obviously, if there's a vaccine, if there's a remedy coming out of that, it will have a major impact on what's going to be happening for 2021. Yeah. Gold travel is such a resilient industry, like it represents roughly about 15% of the GDP worldwide. Mm. It's going to bounce back up. And I think it's going to bounce back up massively. Probably not the same as it was before. So maybe not as much corporate travel. People will not travel as much for business. Mm. Might be more local um, events, let's say, or like 250 miles and less. Yeah. But people will want to go outside of their own. So this is what we're planning right now. It's going to be more local events. Uh, people will be exploring their own cities, their own countries, way before jumping out 5,000 kilometers away. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, interesting, man. It's gonna be yeah. Well, I just get we we got to see what happens and yeah. It is hard. What's happening on your side? Have you been doing something similar as well for planning for twenty twenty one? Um, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> I don't want to put any uh, time. No, so we're we're that. putting everything in place for next year. So most of the events that we have on Rad Season have launched, like have released their dates for next year. So all, all the all the big music festivals and um you know the october fest of the world you know like some like these events have been running for like hundreds and hundreds of years they're not going to stop so they may take a break for a year or two uh so you know like with like things getting like the wimbledon tennis and the olympics getting cancelled and stuff like that um this year so you know things will come back um and for us it's just getting ready for when they do so we're trying to build out our content and make sure that what we what we have on the site is the best information that we can provide for people that are then looking to go to these events when it all starts again. Um, yeah, I was getting pretty excited this year. I had like a festival planned every month, and I was like, "We're going to be doing a lot of road trips." We we moved the company to Portugal, and we were going to be going to Spain every month. Um, um, I had some crazy yeah festivals planned there, and um, not this year. We'll, we'll have to do it next year. So um, yeah, so we're looking at that. Um, and then different things of, um, like we're looking at virtual as well. And then a lot of organizers are kind of either doing a hybrid or they went fully virtual if they couldn't run a physical event. Um, so we're trying to sort of showcase, yeah, what's happening for like online festivals and virtual, virtual events as well. You're just the same, right? You don't have all the, um, the same type of relationship with people. You're not going to get... Uh, the same type of vibe or experience or anything that's close close to it. That's why yeah. I feel like it's only a band aid. But as soon as you'll be able to rip up and start to attend those events in person, it's going to be much more uh, relevant to those. I think so, and, and people are itching. You know, I just want to uh, like me personally. I just want to go out and see some live music after like last yeah. year. I went to like we did like 30, 30 festivals last year and did like twenty. Or something something. About Right before yeah. this call, I was someone in Moscow and they had a gathering of about 500 people. So yeah. they just decided to be open and people are attending this as much as they could. They're actually yeah. overselling the tickets. So it's a oh, matter wow. of pushing things good enough. Yeah, it's interesting. Like here in Europe, it's like obviously like different countries have like having different things and now looking at, okay, like what kind of like what, what things they have in place um, and sort of social distancing and restrictions and things like that, that they can actually make their events happen with like, if they have to cut down numbers. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's a few things going on in like, say places like Serbia, you know, they just had one of their like big events in Belgrade and um, which is a big music festival. So there's stuff that's happening. Um, obviously the big, the massive ones with like 30,000 plus people, if they're like throwing tomatoes at each other and everyone's like climbing on top of each other, those things are going to have to wait. So, um, yeah. You know, but it's fine. Like we'll get new regulation in place. There's going to be a way that they'll find out uh, how to get those things because people are just hungry for them. So now yeah. stadiums are empty or they're starting to slowly to fill back up, but they'll find a way to put either a bracelet or electronics passport. Like I'm not yeah. too stressed. It's coming back. 
Yeah. Cool, man. Good stuff, dude. Well, what's the, what's the best way of everyone, uh, if people want to find out what Stay22 are doing and follow you yeah. guys? So best way is obviously to follow us on uh, LinkedIn or uh, Twitter. So we're mm -hmm. having a good presence on both of them. But most of the time, you can just reach out to the team as well uh, on Facebook or Intercom. We're super easy, accessible. And we're always open to hear new things, right? So if you have any type of idea, recommendation, or actually looking for a job, uh, we're always hiring great talent. So we'll be more than happy to have a chat with you. Cool, man. Thanks, dude. It's been good chatting to you.